Hi, my name is Todd Austin. I'm a professor at University of Michigan. And in this video, in Rust We Trust, we will be looking at an arbitrary buffer overread attack on safe Rust code. Rust code is supposed to be memory access safe, but in this video, I'll demonstrate that it's actually susceptible to microarchitectural attacks. Let's get started. First, let's take a look at what the Rust language is. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the Rust language. It's a great version. You know, it's like a re-envisioning re of the C and C++ language in a way that it's still a systems language, but it's much more safe in the sense that it's both high performance, supports very strong concurrency, but also is much more secure. The reason why Rust is more secure is in particular because it's supposed to be memory safe. And by memory safe, that means that you cannot access out of the bounds of array variables. If you do, there are automatic checks placed inside the Rust code that'll declare an exception if you try to do those, try to go off an end of an array. But it's got ad additional uh, very powerful memory, uh, excuse me, security features, including detecting integer overflow, uh, rewrite permissions on arbitrary variables, has a very unique and powerful uh, ownership memory allocation model, and also doesn't support null types. You have to uh, wrap variables with the option capability in order to uh, return to not return a variable, uh, which forces the programmer to look if the, if the variable exists. So it's a very secure language, but it's actually susceptible to uh, specter attacks, which is a microarchitectural attack. And I'll demonstrate that today, but first I wanna just show you uh, how that attack works. In this window, I've shown the, what's called the specter version one attack gadget. This is a piece of code. This code is functionally correct, but I'm gonna use the specter attack to get it to do a buffer overread. What a buffer overread is, is where we're going to read past the end of an array an access variable, uh, excuse me, memory data that, that, that is illegal to access in that array access. Now, this doesn't modify any memory, but it's actually a very important attack to stop because attackers will often use buffer overreads to uh, sneak out session keys or uh, AES keys, all kinds of information. Uh, de-randomize the address space to allow them to, to do more sophisticated attacks on a program. So it's quite important to stop these. The heart bleed uh, attack, for example, was a buffer overread attack. So in this particular uh, piece of code, when we run this code, uh, we're just going to access array one and then use the value that was returned to access array two and then return that value. And then the index that we're going to access in array one is passed by this IDX variable. So normally when we execute this with, say, uh, uh, an inbounds array index six, in this case, uh, we're going to get to this little array index check because we don't want to go past the end of the array because if we do, there's a, there's, a, there's a check inserted here by the compiler and that check will not do, it'll just basically stop the program because the, the, the Rust is not going to allow you to go past the end of that array. So we first check to see if we can go past the end of the array. And if it's a legal access, it'll go into this next line of code. It'll access array one, take that value and use it to access array two and return it. No problem. But what if we run this with an illegal index? Let's say that 6,000 is an illegal index to array one. Uh, when we get to this if statement, uh, that if statement will not be true, and so we'll just return the zero value down here. Now, this is what the programmer thinks what's, what's happening, and, and conceptually, this is what happens. But now let's take a look at what happens in the microarchitecture, in the underlying high-performance microprocessor that's implementing this code. What actually happens is when this code runs, we get to this if statement here, which is implemented with a branch instruction, and the microarchitecture will say, hmm, it's gonna take me a while to resolve this branch. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna speculate that this branch is gonna go in the same direction as the last time we ran it, which was a valid index. And so it's gonna just speculate that it's gonna execute this next instruction with index 6,000. It's actually gonna access a piece of memory that it shouldn't, 
And then it's going to use that to access array two, again, accessing memory that it shouldn't, doing computation with information that it shouldn't. But eventually this branch is going to resolve. And then the architecture is going to go, oh, we got to get rid of this computation. It was bad. And then it goes back and it goes the other direction and the programmer sees the zero return. That's great. No problem. Now, let's say there was a real clever attacker. And what the cl clever attacker did was take the information from array two that was accessed with this val here. That's this zero and one, for instance. And the clever attacker is going to execute code that's going to flush the data cache and move that array two information into DRAM. Now, let's a little background here. What's DRAM and data cache? Well, DRAM is the memory of your computer. If you open up the case on your laptop, you know, it's little cards of memory that are sitting inside what are called DIMMs, and that's where the bulk of your memory is. But it's very slow to access. So modern microprocessors build these things called data caches. They're actually on the chip with the microprocessor. And they're very fast to access. So when you do access a piece of storage in the DRAM, the microprocessor always brings it up into the data cache for fast access. Okay, so now this time when we speculate, it goes into array access array one and then array two uh, val will access array two. Now, when it accesses that value in array two, it's going to bring the particular value that was accessed up into the data cache, which is, which is fine. That's what it's intended to do. But then the processor says, oh, I'm sorry. I see here that you didn't want to go that direction. So it's going to throw away val. It's going to throw away the return value that was computed here and throw away that computation and then return the zero. But what the microprocessor doesn't do is it doesn't push the value out of the data cache back into the DRAM because the architecture designer says, well, you know, if it's in the D cache, that's fine. It, th this is my implementation. The programmer shouldn't know anything about whether it's in the D cache or the DRAM. But attackers know whether things are in the D cache or the DRAM. And so the attacker, after the return of this function, can actually time the access to zero, time the access to one, know that you get a fast access on zero, which meant that that speculative execution here, when it accessed array two, pulled the zero value, and know that you access the zero, and that is a data breach. It's a data breach. We now have a way to sneak information out of memory in the misspeculation, the incorrectly executed stream of the processor. This is a, a, a general form of microarchitecture attack called the specter attack. And it's very hard to stop, very hard to stop. Generally, you really have to stop this inside the compiler by basically telling in the compiler that we're worried about anybody speculating uh, past this branch. So you can add what's called a fence instruction. And you can tell the processor, don't speculate past this branch. To stop this in the microarchitecture, uh, you basically have to stop speculation and that can cause a lot of performance in the microarchitecture. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research up both on how to implement these attacks. Also a lot of research going on on how to stop these attacks. In general today, though, I would say the way you stop these attacks is the compiler has to be clever about stopping these attacks. All right. So now let's take a look at an actual demo of a processor running Rust code and then using the gadget function to access arbitrary storage. This is a Spectre version one attack in safe Rust. The, the code that is attacking is safe Rust, which means that the code has all of the Rust bounds checking engaged. And it's using the Spectre attack to mispredict past those checks and access, stor access storage. Uh, just a quick note, this um, code was developed by Christopher Felix and Donia Benti, who are both students at University of Michigan. And myself, I'm a professor at University of Michigan, and we intend to release this uh, proof of concept code. Uh, it's been disclosed to the Rust developers. As soon as that responsible disclosure period ends, we'll release this attack code. The reason why we want to release this attack code is to make available a very reliable Spectre v1 attack that compiler developers that want to mitigate this particular vulnerability in Rust can uh, use it to see if they're uh, successfully mitigating that attack. So let's take a look at the demo right now. All right, let's take a look at this demo. 
Inside this demo, I'm going to specifically attack this code that I showed you earlier, where again, we're going to train it by coming in with uh, the correct index, and then we're going to try a little bit later to come in with an invalid index, and then we're going to look at what storage was brought into the cache. Specifically, the attack that we're using here is going to take this uh, vector variable array one. We're going to read past the end of this variable, which has uh, 16 entries. Note, none of these uh, entries are printable characters. We're going to read past the end of this array to the start of this string. Uh, this string is kept in the read-only section of memory. This array is in the heap. So there's, there's a huge distance between these two variables. But we're going to look until we find this hello world, hello world, hello world. Uh, and we'll access that through array one. I'm not showing the rest of the code here because the code is currently not available for disclosure. Uh, we'll, we'll release it once the responsible disclosure period is ended. All right. Okay, let's take a let's try running this attack and see how it works. Okay, well, it didn't work that time. Didn't see any of it. So after the first iteration, if it doesn't uh, get any matches the string, it it simply stops. So let's try running this again. Oh, there it works. So why does it work sometime but not work other times? It really depends on the underlying storage alignments. Are the things that we want to displace from the cache wholly fitting within a cache line? We don't have much control over the underlying storage organization in Rust. So what we do is we just kind of randomize storage every time we run the program. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But here you can see it worked really well. It had 99% accuracy. 99 of 100 letters were read successfully. And oh, there's the one that didn't read that D. It didn't read correctly. So fantastic. That worked really well. Now, I want to do one other thing. When you release an attack like this, people say, huh, how do I know you're not just reading the characters out of the array? Uh, how do I know that you're actually reading characters you know, from one array uh, to another and not just reading out of the array? Because, I mean, the data is in your program. Hello, world, hello. Right? I mean, I showed you right here that the, the data is right there. It's in my program. Well, we were actually reading from array one from secret, and you can see that from this code, we're reading from array one. But just to make the experiment a little more compelling, um, I'm gonna switch these two lines of code. So normally we're gonna read a character from secret by going off the end of array one, and then we're gonna just basically load a piece of storage in the cache, it indicates which one of the characters it is. Now instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load this value plus one. Now, the only way to read hello world hello is to read it from the misspeculation stream of this function. And if I add one, I'm going to get this character stream right here. IFMPP, that's just H next letter, E next letter, L next letter, etc. This particular set of data doesn't exist in the program. It only exists in the, the microarchitecture speculation stream. If we can rebuild the program and all we see is that particular string. No, it didn't work that time. Let's try it one more time. Oh, we got the alignment we wanted. Look at this. I F M P P exclamation X P. So we're seeing this information only exists in the misspeculation stream. Obviously, uh, I'm able to leak information past the end of the array with computation applied to it in the misspeculation stream out using Spectre V1 attack. This attack is working on Rust. I hope you enjoyed that demo. Sure was a lot of fun to make. If you want to learn more about what I've been talking about today, in particular, if you want to know more about me, check out my LinkedIn page at this link. If you'd like to learn more about the Rust programming language and how it can help you develop more secure, safe programs, go to rustlang.org. And if you'd like to learn more about Spectre microarchitectural attacks, visit the wiki page on Spectre security vulnerabilities. Thanks again for watching our demo and take care.